to get your attention, puppies. <laughs> well, there's a metaphor. If you want to hear the metaphor, I have to start. <laughs> so, uh, good morning. Uh, so, this talk and next one will be about uh, Spectre Meltdown. So, I'm going to start and then David Woodhouse will continue. And uh, you may wonder what the puppies are for. I mean, they're all nice and cute. Uh, the thing is that they are all pretty advanced animals in the sense that they are all mammals. So, they have a lot of complicated things in common. In, uh, in how they work. Instead, there are these other animals, they're just as cute, two of them. And uh, the other one is dead, so we don't bother if it's not cute. Uh, and those three are much simpler animals. They're cold-blooded, uh, they don't have a spine, uh, and w one of them doesn't have a spine, and so on. So, uh, these, are, these are just like computers. There are computers that are more complicated, like the smartphone, uh, laptop, or the mainframe, and computers that are simpler, even the car keys have a computer inside them, uh, the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi, they have simple computers inside, inside them, microcontroller, or a very simple in-order ARM processor. And uh, this uh, talk is going to talk about the, the ones on the top. They go from small to big, that's not to say that they couldn't be bigger, uh, but these days they are they more or less fit in a cupboard. Uh, uh, and uh, what all these computers have in common is they have an MMU, they have caches, they have a branch predictor usually, they have speculative execution. Uh, some of them have simultaneous multithreading and. Uh, some of them even do virtualization. And all this adds to the complexity of these computers. And uh, uh, it's basically something that evolved through the years. And now we have conversion from the telephone to the big mainframe. We have this stuff in all of our most commonly used computers. And uh, another thing that is in common to pretty much all the complex computers, let's call it like that, it's privilege separation. Uh, they have, uh, these computers are all able to run multiple tasks uh, that are isolated from each other and from the kernel so that they cannot stomp on the kernel. And the um, privileged tasks cannot read other test data unless they can, of course, unless they explicitly are given that data. And they cannot read kernel data unless they are given that data explicitly. The operating system wants to do this, but it cannot do this without help from the processor. The processor is required to implement privilege separation fully. Uh, it can be a very simple implementation based on segmentation. It can be complicated with paging, but the processor must do something. So the idea behind the Spectre and Meltdown is what if the operating system cannot do this because the processor doesn't help as much as you thought? And to understand this, we have to go a little back. So we start from how processor executes instruction. Typically, they have to fetch the instruction, they have to decode it, they have to execute it, and then they have to write the results back to the registers. And if they did it in such a trivial way, like one instruction after another, uh, it would be pretty slow. In fact, even the 6502, how many have programmed a 6502? How many know what a 6502 is? Good. Okay, so it was the, com the processor in the Apple II and the Commodore 64, depending whether you are European or American. <laughs> and uh, even the 6502, for example, overlapped the last uh, phase with the fetch of the next instruction. So uh, this is called pipelining. and. Uh, uh, in the most common uh, implementation, uh, it's basically like this. The processor tries to execute, to start one instruction uh, on every clock cycle. So you have uh, on every clock cycle one instruction that's at, at least at the end when the processor is executing everything. You have one instruction doing the write back, one instruction doing the execute, one instruction doing the decode, and one instruction doing the fetch. In, basically in the opposite order of, of the pipelining. Uh, of course, this doesn't always work well, 
because uh, the um, write back uh, will make the results uh, available for the next instructions execute phase so you can have this kind of bypass but if you have a branch you have a problem you don't know the destination of the unconditional branch until after the decode phase but you need to know the destination in order to fetch that instruction so you in introduce a bubble uh, in the simplest implementation the unconditional branch delays the execution of the next instruction by one clock cycle. And uh, there are various tricks uh, that were popular in the 80s to deal with these, such as delay slots, but we don't want delay slots in 2018, except if it's a DSP probably, but in general, delay slots turned out to be a bad idea, and instead processors are doing what we will see in the remainder of the talk. So for conditional branches, actually it's even worse because uh, you don't know the actual destination until the, the execute phase. So a conditional branch in a simple implementation would delay the next instruction by almost the entire pipeline. And this is pretty bad. So what you do is branch prediction. In, uh, in the branch prediction, uh, if you have branch prediction, the decode phase finds a conditional instruction, uh, branch instruction and it already tries to guess the next instruction, whether the branch will be taken. There are various schemes of branch predictor. You can look at that uh, page for a quick parade of uh, many branch prediction. But basically, there's two kinds of branch prediction. One is static branch prediction. That is, you just try to figure out uh, the next instruction based on the machine coder. And the simplest thing you can do is just predict that all branches are taken. Why does this work? Because uh, statistically, a loop will execute more than one time, so that you will have more branches in loops than branches in if statements. So uh, because the loop will roll more than one time, you just predict that the loop will roll forever, essentially. And this actually, in fact, already gives you 70% accuracy, so it's much better than just guessing randomly. Even better, predict backwards jumps are, as taken, forwards branches as not taken, and uh, this is 80%. Uh, it could probably be even more because uh, the, comp the compiler sometimes can also figure out which branches are taken, which branches are not taken, and it can arrange the block of the, of the program so that uh, likely branches go backwards and unlikely branches go forwards. And you can also have ints in the machine language instruction, but they are not really a particular good, particularly good improvement because the compiler does it for you, basically. Um, the, the reordering of the blocks. So what you do to go beyond the 80% is dynamic branch prediction. In dynamic branch prediction, you make a guess based on the past program behavior by storing these guesses in the branch history buffer. So you run the program counter to, through some hashing function. You go in the branch history buffer, and the branch history buffer tells you this branch is uh, taken or this branch is not taken. And uh, mm, this is not a particularly good branch prediction, but this is the basic idea. Uh, branch prediction that is dynamic easily goes uh, above 90% uh, prediction. Uh, for example, if instead of saying just taken and not taken, you can say it fits very much taken, so that even if it's occasionally not taken, the processor will keep uh, uh, story, um, predicting it as taken for some time. This gets you to 90% and it's pretty old, I mean, 40 years. Uh, you can store the history. Um, this is a bit more complicated, but it's the way, for example, the branch predictor in the Pentium 2 work. And in that case, for example, it can predict perfectly that every four branches, uh, sorry, every four um, iteration of the loop will go through one side of the if and the other will go down the else. So one zero 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 means once taken, three times not taken, and then uh, it repeats. Uh, there's also multi-level predictors. Of course, if just like everything in computers, you add one level and things are better than before. Uh, and uh, it gives you a nice, I mean, 93 to 95% seems little, but it means that it's getting right 30% of the cases that were wrong before. I mean, 
the wrong one goes down from seven to five. Once you get to 95%, it's hard to, to get, get uh, huge improvements. And there are even more complicated predictors. Uh, AMD currently is using a neural network predictor. I, I'm not like deep, deep learning thing, like simple neural network that you can implement with circuits, but still neural network. And there's also the geometric predictor uh, by Intel. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's basically a lot of um, predictors uh, chained so that uh, they, they are organized in a geometric sequence. So the first one predicts uh, bit zero of the sequence, the second one predicts bit one of the sequence, and so on. And it can get right some uh, loop length up to maybe 1024 or something like that. So it's pretty good. And of course, you can also do loop detection if you find that uh, a register contains 50 and it's decremented just before the loop. You just say this loop is going to be taken for the next 50 iterations. So you can get as fancy as you want. The idea is that mm, you improve the pipelining because if you fetch from the predicted destination, you just have the usual one uh, clock cycle bubble that you have for unconditional branches. Of course, if it's wrong, then uh, uh, you have to introduce a delay, but it's still all right, because by the time you find the right destination, the write back has not yet happened. So the, the execution was wrong, but you just roll it back. And uh, uh, you will be able to, to start with the right destination long before the, the, the wrong execution has caused side effects. And this is for direct branches. For indirect branches, instead, the decode phase doesn't have to know uh, to guess whether the branch will be taken, but it still has to guess where the branch will, la will land because the, the destination is in a register. It can be anywhere. And uh, in fact, processors have uh, separate branch predictor logic for indirect branches. Mm, just like for loops, uh, where you can do loop detection, they also have a separate uh, branch predictor uh, for uh, subroutine call and, uh, and return. Basically, it's a small cache of the stack, basically, or for risk processor of the contents of the link register. But these are two uh, branch predictors for uh, indirect branches because return from subroutine is basically an indirect branch. So one is called the branch target buffer and the other is called the return stack buffer. But these are simple. I will not go in details. So. This is already pretty good. You, you have basically one instruction per cycle uh, in the optimal case. Uh, but if you want to do better, you can do super scalar execution, which is actually a pretty old idea. Uh, it was there in the big uh, black and white um, computer from the beginning of the talk in 1966. And the idea is that you just duplicate all your execution units and if the stars align correctly, uh, the um, processor will be able to execute two instructions in a single um, clock cycle. So for example, for these six instructions, it takes three clock cycles to, to execute them and you have two instructions per cycle. In reality, things are a little bit more complicated. So let's say uh, the processor has started uh, executing this instruction and all was right. Uh, maybe you could have uh, a data dependency. So the second instruction is using a result that comes from the first. In that case, the second uh, execution unit cannot start right away. And everything below the fourth instruction incurs a bubble. So in that case, you will see that uh, you will have uh, four, instruction, four cycles to execute the six instructions. So the performance is actually only 1.5 instruction per cycle. And this is more or less how the Pentium 1 worked. It had basically double issue uh, superscalar execution. And uh, sometimes it's not just the stars that have to align correctly, but the compiler that has to be smart enough. In this case, the, the code is doing exactly the same thing, but two instructions have been swapped. In the left case, you have to introduce uh, a bubble after the load and between before the add because the add needs uh, their one register. And then you need another bubble uh, between the add and the compare. And so you have uh, one, two, three, four cycles here 
and 1.25 IPC. Or if you are lucky and uh, the processor is good enough, maybe the first load, uh, the, the, next, the, the load in the next iteration can overlap, and then you actually get to 10 instructions for only seven cycles. But still, 1.43 is not as good as it can be. In the right side, uh, instead, everything is perfect. The pipeline is as full as it gets. And uh, then uh, you can have uh, five instructions for three cycles. And that's like 15% better performance. So we should have processors with like six uh, instruction units uh, and uh, just let the compiler do it. How many of you recognize explicitly parallel instruction computing? Yeah. How many of you have used this thing? More than I expected, but still, we are not using them because the idea of just letting the compiler, compiler do it doesn't work. Uh, so explicitly parallel instruction computing is how Intel called the very long instruction word computers. And it basically means stuff everything uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a super scalar in order processor and hope uh, that things work well. But the way things actually work in modern processors is that you have out-of-order execution, 1967, but it only got to common processors in personal computers with the Pentium Pro, so 1994, something like that. So fetch and decode in out-of-order execution are more or less the same as usual, but instructions are, do not go directly to the execution stage. They go to a reservation station uh, which is basically a queue. And the execution, uh, execution units pick the instruction from the queue. This, the, the instructions stay in the queue until their operands are available, and then they are dispatched to the execution units. And then, after a while, once the results are ready, instructions are retired. But uh, only the fetch and the code proceed in order. Everything else is just as things get ready. And things are a bit more complicated, but uh, um, basically this is what the pipeline uh, looks like. We went from uh, five, four, uh, sorry, uh, stages to five or six. I mean, in the previous slides I omitted the memory, so basically the only new thing is that we have introduced the, the reserve stage and that the write back is now called uh, retire. But it's just one extra stage. And this is how it works. Uh, let's say that uh, at some point uh, you have uh, done the, the execution phase of the load, which is instruction one, but you cannot yet do the add because this is the bad version of the code, so to speak. It's the one that uh, had bad performance in, uh, in order execution. Here, you still cannot dispatch things to the execution unit number two uh, because you need the load to finish. But you can already execute instruction number three on execution unit one while memory finishes fetching the, the operand. And uh, so we have already some little bit of in order execution. We have instruction one and three that are in flight and instruction two and four are stuck in the reservation station. On the next cycle, the dependencies are ready, so instruction one unlocks uh, the instruction number two, and instruction three unlocks instruction number four. So we have two instructions that are executing, two instructions that are being retired, and then finally, we can retire the other instructions and so on. And this, despite the number of bubbles, uh, uses the execution units very efficiently so much that actually the number of instructions is the same as if the compiler had done the, the reordering. So it seems to work. Uh, and uh, to make it even better, we can have a longer pipeline. Just do not bring things to the extreme, otherwise you get the Pentium 4. But uh, this is the Pentium 3 processor pipeline. It splits the fetch decode in two, the decode in five, uh, in, sorry, in three. Uh, the rename and schedule, which is basically the reservation station phase in three, and uh, 10 clock cycles overall. Because uh, the pipeline is split, the clock cycles can be shorter and more instruction can be fetched in the same time. Also, the penalty for the uh, unconditional branches goes down because you can figure out the destination of the branches in the beginning of the, of the decode phase. You don't have to wait for all three uh, cycles. 
Of course, uh, as I was saying before, you don't have to take this too much uh, to the extreme because otherwise you get too many bubbles and things get slower. And the uh, current processors have 14 to 17 stages for their uh, processor uh, pipeline. So it, they are, it actually doesn't look very different from that one. Uh, so in general, uh, out of order execution uh, seems to be a pretty successful idea. To make it even better, we can do speculative execution. So the idea is that uh, uh, the loop will execute the same instructions a lot of times. We just guess that they will be executed because uh, the, uh, out of order execution makes it easy to abort an instruction. Uh, you only affect the, the, opera, the, the registers in the final retirement phase. So you first execute with uh, uh, R2 equal zero, then R2 equal one, R2 equal two, and at this point the branch if not equal instruction would fail, but the processor goes ahead and tries executing the, the instructions with the wrong operands, and it will just detect the thing in time and, uh, and abort the, the final execution. So why is speculative execution a nice thing? because it delays the handling of mispredicted branches and it keeps the execution units busy while the predictions are correct. So you have less bubbles, you have things that start earlier and everyone is happy. The problem is that all this is a good idea but then we add caches and caches bring side channels with them. A cache is basically an answer to the question, uh, what do we do if memory is low? It, memory is so slow that you cannot anymore add, do a memory access in one uh, cycle as in the toy example before. Uh, memory takes at least 200 clock cycles for, or, or even more. So it doesn't fit a pipeline. You cannot have 200 stages in your pipeline. So as before, of course, we add another level of indirection. It always works, I told you. Uh, we have we had a cache, it's small, it's fast, uh, unfortunately it only fits a small subset of system memory. The cache works like this, some of the bits from the address form the index, you look up the index in the cache, and then looking up the index gives you one or more tags, you look at those tags, you compare the tags against another part of the address, and uh, that gives you some number of bytes, usually like 64 bytes, maybe 32, maybe 128. And uh, then you can do your access within those bytes from the cache instead of doing it in system memory if uh, the tag matches. If the tag doesn't match, you have a cache miss and things are slow. So what is the side channel? The problem is that because accesses to cached location are fast and accesses to uncached location are slow, you just time the time that it takes to do an access and then you can tell if a location is in the cache. So this is how the side channels work. And they, are, uh, they go like this. Uh, in the first uh, line, you, you access a pointer, then uh, you compute a kind of offset based on bit zero of the pointer. And uh, 64 is the size of a cache line. So now you do the access to the second uh, uh, value that you computed. And this will hit two different cache lines depending on whether that bit is zero or one. Before doing the access, we make sure that the first uh, cache line is filled and the second is empty. And now, if the bit is zero, the access will be fast. If the bit is one, the access will be slow. And you can do better than that and do multiple bits at a time, but the idea is that one. Uh, and uh, side channel attacks are not a new thing. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown are side channel attacks, but before Spectre and Meltdown, there were already many kinds of uh, side channel attacks uh, limited to attacking specific programs. So you, if you were on, uh, here for the talk on Zinc, uh, it was mentioned that most cryptographic algorithms do not use branches, and that's why. 
uh, if you do not use if, the content of the cache is going to be the same independent of, uh, of the values that are, you are uh, passing to the cryptographic primitive, more or less, and you are resilient against uh, said channel attacks. But uh, speculative execution introduces an interesting kind of side channel attack. Mm, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, there are basic mitigations that you can do to prevent side channel attacks. And the simplest way is just do not provide a, user, a high precision timer. Uh, and you also have to skip on uh, shared memory because otherwise you just create a thread, it counts up very fast. And that is a timer. I mean, it it's just a counter, but it, you can use it as a timer. So as I was saying before, a speculative execution brings some interesting example of uh, side channel attacks. So in that case, uh, we already had uh, an out of bounds access. The first load uh, was accessing uh, uh, the first uh, byte past the end of the array. What if R2 wasn't three? What if R2 was a huge value? It, the, that instruction would access a random uh, byte in memory. So this is basically the essence of uh, Spectre. You find the memory load uh, where you can control the address for example, an FS, FCNTL system call that accesses a file descriptor table. And uh, you uh, train the branch predictor so that the load will execute. Uh, you train the branch predictor. In this case, it's not even hard. You have to convince the branch predictor the file descriptor, that the file descriptor will be in range. But typically, the file descriptor is always in range. So the branch is very likely going to be predicted uh, as taken. Uh, sorry, as going uh, down to the load. And then uh, you convince the victim uh, of the attack to execute the code. In this case, it's as simple as executing a system call that goes in the kernel and execute uh, FCNTL. And then uh, the processor will speculatively load from FD table. And when you get back from, uh, from the kernel, you observe the effects on the cache. This works. Uh, for the kernel very easily, but you can do it against another program. You can do it even across the network. Uh, uh, and in that case, it will be very slow. You may need uh, a lot of trials to, to get a statistically significant uh, uh, difference between the timings. But it's doable. You can extract like maybe 10 bits per hour, but 10 bits per hour means it only takes you three or four days to extract a private key. So. Uh, how do you avoid Spectre in software? Basically, you have to find all these data-dependent loads and prevent speculative execution. This can be done through a conditional move instruction, through some other tricks, such as the ones used by the Linux kernel, but basically they are conditional move instructions. It can be done manually, it can be done through the compiler, uh, but basically it's just a, a whack-a-mole thing. Uh, this version of, uh, of uh, Spectre is pretty much something that you have to fix by hand. You, there are uh, research ideas on how to uh, remember whether a value came from uh, your current privileged domain or another privileged domain, but for now we are stuck with doing it by hand or through the compiler. In hardware, however, you can fix the indirect pre branch prediction version by preventing uh, uh, speculative execution of indirect branches. Uh, again, this can be done in software, but also in hardware. Uh, the branch predictor, uh, the branch target buffer from the indirect branch predictor works like this, very similar to a cache. However, it will always uh, give back a target address uh, even uh, uh, if there is no tag match. In fact, there is no tag at all because the idea is that worst case, you just fetch from the wrong place. Unfortunately, uh, with Spectre, that wrong place may actually reveal private information uh, to the attacker. So the solution is just to add a tag to the branch target buffer. Unfortunately, making your branch uh, target buffer larger with more bits, it's not something that you can do on exi existing processors. But fortunately, processors have chicken bits. Uh, basically, they are debugging tools. 
just like uh, you can turn off uh, some config symbols in the kernel, you can also turn off uh, or, or set some CCTLs in the kernel. You can also turn off uh, some parts of the processor by writing to a, a model specific register. Maybe some feature is not working correctly. You set you distribute a firmware patch that dis disables uh, that uh, that feature, and nobody notices except when you have to disable something that gives you a 30% uh, performance penalty. But generally, there are plenty of chicken bits, and they are used on our computers without us noticing. Usually they are set by the firmware, but if needed, the operating system can also poke at the, uh, at the chicken bits. And so this shows the importance of defending in depth. You update your firmware, you update your OS, you update your browser so that it removes the, the high resolution timers. There's a chance that one of the components that you have updated uh, will mitigate the, the vulnerabilities. So, so far we have looked at Spectre. And now we go to Meltdown. Meltdown <coughs> relies on paging. Uh, how many of you knows, know what paging is? Okay. Th th that was expected, but <laughs> still good. Uh, how many of you know that what paging is because they had read the slides before? Uh, okay, no one. <laughs> so page, what paging is, is translating the addresses before reaching memory. You have virtual addresses and you have physical addresses and the mapping between virtual and physical address is different for each program and is stored into page tables. Uh, why do you do this? Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, it provides isolation and it helps you giving shared memory access to, process, to different processes without having to agree on uh, a single uh, memory address for that process. And it also has the nice benefit that you can use page tables to track memory accesses. You can do swapping, you can do copy and write, and it's pretty central to the way that the operating systems uh, work on everything starting from basically the 80s or 70s, depending on like Unix, first version didn't have paging that segmentation, but uh, later versions also had paging. And this is how uh, it works. As I was saying before, the page tables go in the MMU together with the virtual address. And what you get out of the page tables and the MMU is a physical address and some permissions. For example, whether the page is there at all, whether the page is read-only or read-write, whether the page is executable or not, whether the page contains user data or kernel slash supervisor data. And uh, whenever the program requires you to do a memory access, there can be two outcomes. Either the MMU gives you the physical address or the MMU raises a page fault, and page fault gives you the reason for, uh, for not being able to access that page. And those are basically related to the permissions before. Page could be not present, could be read-only, could be not executable, could, you could be at the one privilege level, and so on. And now, you put this together with the small pseudocode for the um, uh, for for the side channel attack and uh, if the first uh, instruction is a supervisor address it will cause a page fault but maybe instruction will proceed down the pipeline until retirement and maybe you can uh, observe the effects on the cache because the speculative load has, seized the, has seen the content of an address that it wasn't supposed to see. So Meltdown is pretty bad, also because it's very easy to exploit. It can be avoided in software, fortunately. So in this case, we can do a 100% effective solution just by modifying the kernel, just. Uh, and uh, the solution is to use uh, separate uh, page tables for user and supervisor modes. So when uh, a user program is running, it only sees its memory. It doesn't see anything belonging to the kernel or to other processes. Some architectures, such as the IBM Z, the mainframe thing, always has uh, separate page tables. Unfortunately, on other systems, it's slower because you have to switch the page tables 
when uh, uh, you get into the kernel, you have to switch them again when you get out of the kernel, when you get an interrupt. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, Microsoft, uh, the Linux community, and Apple all implemented the uh, page table switching or page table isolation as it's called uh, before the disclosure of Meltdown in, uh, in January last year, this year, because people knew about it and had a few months to get ready. It's not a trivial change. So how do you fix this in hardware for in the future so that we don't have uh, to go through the um, uh, same performance penalty? It's not easy. Uh, so the way mm, to, to, f to figure it out, you have to look a bit deeper in uh, how the MMU works. It doesn't immediately look at the page tables because the page tables are in memory, memory is low, and uh, you have to do your translation as fast as possible. The way it actually works uh, is that uh, the virtual address and the physical address have a part that is in common, which is the offset within the page, and uh, uh, a part that is different, that is the part before the page. And that part before the page is used to index a, another kind of cache. It's a cache with a funky name. It's a translation look-aside buffer, or TLB. Uh, and uh, if uh, the TLB lookup succeeds, you can go straight to get the physical address and the permissions, otherwise you have to do the slow page table access. And uh, in practice, we only care about the case with the TLB. If uh, you have to access the page tables, in practice things are very slow and you don't have enough um, instructions in flight to perform the attack. The way uh, caches work when you have paging is also pretty interesting. Uh, you could have a f what is called a physically indexed and physically tagged cache. Uh, in, in such a cache, uh, the tag and the index are both coming from the physical address. So you first do the TLB miss, the lookup, and if you have a hit, you go to the cache. But actually, you can do something that is much more clever, at least at three different vulnerabilities. Meltdown is uh, the easiest to exploit, but also the easiest to mitigate because uh, there's no processor changes required, uh, even though there is a performance penalty. <coughs> the variant of Spectre within direct branches is uh, already harder to exploit, but has the big issue that it can be used to attack the hypervisor. And uh, full protection uh, requires either processor changes or at least microcode changes, or it requires a huge performance penalty too. So Spectre in direct branch is already kind of a uh, pain in the ass. 
Spectral conditional branch is the hardest to exploit, the hardest to mitigate because we are stuck with whack-a-mole for now, uh, or changing the compiler and rebuilding everything. And full protection also requires processor changes that are basically a research topic. Fortunately, it's also the hardest to exploit. It's mostly theoretical, though not entirely, because, for example, of the attack that I mentioned with the network access over the cloud even. And there is another one that is more recent. It only came out uh, publicly last August, which is somewhere in the middle. It's called L1TF. And uh, it has basically the worst aspects of Meltdown and the worst aspects of Spectre indirect together. But fortunately, it can only be used to extract data that is already in the cache. So that's the silver lining. And that's why I placed it somewhere more in the hardware exploit uh, area. So these are serious threats with proof of concept exploits that e exist. Uh, and this is just uh, scraping the surface. There are more, more variants of uh, speculative side channel attack. Uh, for example, you could speculatively read the system registers and get access to operating system kernel information that way. And uh, also simultaneous multithreading is not quite dead yet, but uh, close because simultaneous multithreading makes it much easier to access, uh, to do this kind of attacks because uh, the two threads run on the same core and they share the cache. At the same time, there's no need to panic. There are uh, hardware vulnerabilities that have been there for years, such as Rohammer. Rohammer has uh, exploits written in JavaScript available, but we still don't have, unfortunately, ECC on our laptops. And also there are many levels of software mitigations available. So basically the best thing that we can do is defend in depth and make sure that we update the firmware, the OS, the browser as much as we can. So that's it for now. <laughs> Any questions?